Jesus, life of my soul, object of my ardent desire, nothing will stifle your love in my heart. Power of our mutual love assures me of death. Hidden Jesus, glorious pledge of my resurrection, all my life is concentrated in you. It is you, O host, who empower me to love forever, and I know that you will love me as your child in return. Hidden Jesus, my purest love, my life with you has begun already here on earth, and it will become fully manifest in the eternity to come, because our mutual love will never change. Hidden Jesus, sole desire of my soul, you alone are to me more than the delights of heaven. My soul searches for you only. Or above all gifts and graces, you who come to me under the form of bread, hidden Jesus, take at last to yourself my thirsting heart, which burns for you with the pure fire of the seraphim. I go through life in your footsteps, invincible, with head held high like a knight, feeble maid though I be. For a month now, I have been feeling worse. Every time I cough, I feel my lungs disintegrating. It sometimes happens that I feel the complete decay of my own corpse. It is hard to express how great a suffering this is. Although I fully agree to this with my will, it is nevertheless a great suffering for nature, greater than wearing a hair shirt or flagellation to the point of blood. I have felt it especially when I was going to the refectory. It took great effort for me to eat anything because food made me sick. I also started at this time to suffer from pains in my intestines. All highly seasoned dishes caused me such immense pain that I spent many nights writhing in pain and in tears for the sake of sinners. However, I asked my confessor what to do, whether I should continue to suffer this for the sake of sinners or ask the superiors for an exception by way of milder food. He decided that I should ask the superiors for milder food, and thus I followed his directions, seeing that this humiliation was more pleasing to God. One day, I began to doubt as to how it was possible to feel this continual decaying of the body, and at the same time to be able to walk and work. Perhaps this was some kind of illusion, yet it cannot be an illusion because it caused me such terrible pains. As I was thinking about this, one of the sisters came to converse with me. After a minute or two, she made a terribly wry face and said, Sister, I smell a corpse here as though it were decaying. Oh, how dreadful it is. I said to her, Do not be frightened, sister. That smell of a corpse comes from me. She was very surprised and said she could not stand it any longer. After she had gone, I understood that God had allowed her to sense this so that I would have no doubt, but that he was no less than miraculously keeping the knowledge of this suffering from the whole community. Oh my Jesus, only you know the full depth of this sacrifice. Nevertheless, when in the refectory, I still had to bear being the object of their frequent suspicion that I was being fussy about my food. At such times, as always, I hasten to the tabernacle and bow before the ciborium, and there draw strength to accept God's will. That which I have written is not yet everything. Today, during confession, breaking the wafer with me spiritually, he gave me the following wishes. Be as faithful as you can to the grace of God. Secondly, beg God's mercy for yourself and for the whole world, because you are all in great need of God's mercy. Two days before Christmas, these words were read in the refectory. Tomorrow is the birth of Jesus Christ, according to the flesh. At these words, my soul was pierced by the light and love of God, and I gained deeper knowledge of the mystery of the incarnation of the Son of God. How great is the mercy of God contained in the mystery of the incarnation of the Son of God. Today the Lord gave me knowledge of his anger toward mankind, which deserves to have its days shortened because of its sins. But I learned that the world's existence is maintained by chosen souls, that is, the religious orders. Woe to the world when there will be a lack of religious orders. J.M.J. I perform each deed in the face of death. I do it now as I would want to see it in my last hour. Although life, like the wind, will pass swiftly by, no deed undertaken for God will perish. I feel the complete decay of my organism. Although I am still living and working, death will be no tragedy for me, because I have long felt it.
Although it is very unpleasant for nature to constantly smell one's own corpse, yet it is not so terrible when the soul is filled with God's light. Because in it faith, hope, love, and contrition are awakened, daily I make great efforts to take part in community life, thereby gaining graces for soul salvation, shielding them by my sacrifice from the fire of hell. For the salvation of even a single soul is worth the sacrifice of a lifetime, and the bearing of the greatest sacrifices and torments, seeing how great the glory it gives God. Lord, although you often make known to me the thunders of your anger, your anger vanishes before lowly soul. Although you are great, Lord, you allow yourself to be overcome by a lowly and deeply humble soul. O oh, humility, the most precious of virtue, how few souls possess you. I see only a semblance of this virtue everywhere, but not the virtue itself. Lord, reduce me to nothingness in my own eyes, that I may find grace in yours. Christmas Eve, 1937 After Holy Communion, the Mother of God gave me to experience the anxious concern she had in her heart because of the Son of God. But this anxiety was permeated with such fragrance of abandonment to the will of God that I should call it rather a delight than an anxiety. I understood how my soul ought to accept the will of God in all things. It is a pity I cannot write this the way I experienced it. My soul was plunged in deep recollection all day long. Nothing could tear me away from this recollection, neither duties nor the business I had with lay people. Before supper, I went into the chapel for a moment to break the wafer spiritually with those beloved persons so dear to my heart, though far away. First, I steeped myself in a profound prayer and asked the Lord for graces for them all as a group and then for each one individually. Jesus gave me to know how much this pleased him, and my soul was filled with even greater joy to see that God loves in a special way those whom we love. After I had gone into the refectory during the reading, my whole being found itself plunged in God. Interiorly, I saw God looking at us with great pleasure. I remained alone with the Heavenly Father. At that moment, I had a deeper knowledge of the three divine persons, whom we shall contemplate for all eternity, and after millions of years, shall discover that we have just barely begun our contemplation. After I had gone into the refectory, during the reading, my whole being found itself plunged in God. Interiorly, I saw God looking at us with great pleasure. I remained alone with the Heavenly Father. At that moment, I had a deeper knowledge of the three divine persons whom we shall contemplate for all eternity, and after millions of years, shall discover that we have just barely begun our contemplation. Oh, how great is the mercy of God, who allows man to participate in such a high degree in his divine happiness. At the same time, what great pain pierces my heart at the thought that so many souls have spurned this happiness. When we began to share the wafer, a sincere and mutual love reigned among us. Honor Superior Irene expressed his wish to me. Sister, the works of God proceed slowly, so do not be in a hurry. In general, the sister sincerely wished me great love, which is that which I desire above all. I saw that these wishes truly came from their hearts, except for one sister, who had a concealed malice in her wishes, although this did not cause me much pain, for my soul was pervaded by God. Yet this enlightened me as to why God communicates so little with a soul of this kind, and I learned that such a soul is always seeking itself, even in holy things. Oh, how good the Lord is in not letting me go astray. I know that he will guard me, even jealously, but only as long as I remain little, because it is with such that the great Lord likes to commune. As to proud souls, he watches them from afar and opposes them. Although I wanted to keep vigil for some time before the midnight mass, I could not do so. I fell asleep at once, and I was even feeling very weak. But when they rang the bells for midnight mass, I jumped to my feet at once, and dressed, though with great difficulty, because I felt sick again and again. When I arrived at midnight mass, from the very beginning, I steeped myself in deep recollection, during which time I saw the stable of Bethlehem, filled with great radiance, the Blessed Virgin, all lost in the deepest of love, was wrapping Jesus in swaddling clothes, but Saint Joseph was still asleep. 
Only after the mother of God put Jesus in the manger, the light of God awakened Joseph, who was also praying. But after a while, I was left alone with the infant Jesus, who stretched out his little hands to me. And I understood that I was to take him in my arms. Jesus pressed his head against my heart and gave me to know by his profound gaze how good he found it to be next to my heart. At that moment, Jesus disappeared and the bell was ringing for Holy Communion. My soul was languishing with joy, but toward the end of the Mass, I felt so weak that I had to leave the chapel and go to my cell, as I felt unable to take part in the community tea. But my joy throughout the whole Christmas season was immense, because my soul was unceasingly united with the Lord. I have come to know that every soul would like to have divine comforts, but is by no means willing to forsake human comforts, whereas these two things cannot be reconciled. During this Christmas season, I have sensed that certain souls have been praying for me. I rejoice that such spiritual union and knowledge exist already here on earth. O oh my Jesus, praise be to you for all this. In the greatest torments of soul, I am always alone, but no, not alone, for I am with you, Jesus. But here I am speaking about other people. None of them understands my heart, but this does not surprise me anymore. Whereas I used to be surprised when my intentions were condemned and wrongly interpreted, no, this does not surprise me now at all. People do not know how to perceive the soul. They see the body and they judge according to the body. But as distant as heaven is from earth, so distant are God's thoughts from our thoughts. I myself have experienced that quite often. It happens that the Lord said to me, It should be of no concern to you how anyone else acts. You are to be my living reflection, true love and mercy. I answered, Lord, but they often take advantage of my goodness. That makes no difference, my daughter. That is no concern of yours. As for you, be always merciful toward other people, and especially toward sinners. Oh, how painful it is to me that souls so seldom unite themselves to me in holy communion. I wait for souls, and they are indifferent towards me. I love them tenderly and sincerely, and they distrust me. I want to lavish my graces on them, and they do not want to accept them. They treat me as a dead object, whereas my heart is full of love and mercy. In order that you may know at least some of my pain, imagine the most tender of mothers, who has great love for her children, while those children spurn her love. Consider her pain. No one is in a position to console her. This is but a feeble image and likeness of my love. Write, speak of my mercy. Tell souls where they are to look for solace, that is, in a tribunal of mercy, the sacrament of reconciliation. There the greatest miracles take place and are incessantly repeated. To avail oneself of this miracle, it is not necessary to go on a great pilgrimage or to carry out some external ceremony. It suffices to come with faith to the feet of my representative and to reveal to him one's misery, and a miracle of divine mercy will be fully demonstrated. Were a soul like a decaying corpse so that from a human standpoint there would be no hope of restoration and everything would already be lost, it is not so with God. The miracle of divine mercy restores that soul in full. Oh, how miserable are those who do not take advantage of the miracle of God's mercy. You will call out in vain, but it will be too late. J.M.J.